Well, what I'd like to do is just pass it around and, and uh, we'll pass something around so that uh, you can uh, uh, say what you can do, okay? Uh, you can help with the planning, you can help with housing people, that would be great, so. Excuse me, could you tell me again, I'm a new member, so I don't know, what, what is this going to it is uh, the, the Washington State League oh, puts on an action workshop which gets you tuned in to what the State League is looking at, which you're all members of, remember? Right, right. You're not just members here. You're members of the State League and what the legislative focus will be in Olympia starting January 14th when the, when the legislature meets and then how you can uh, help advocate for state level issues. Okay, so we should give it kind of all day so it's a rough track. It's an all day thing, yeah. It starts, uh, uh, programs will start at 9.30 and we'll be out by 2.30 or 3 o'clock. <clears throat> Thank you. And lunch will be part of it. It is something you do need to register for and there, it's a $25 registration fee that includes your lunch and all your materials and we'll help get some of the speakers here because uh, uh, you know, most of our lobby team issue chairs live in that uh, Puget Sound area because they're going to Olympia all the time. But we've got ways we want people here uh, mm -hmm. on this side of the state to be able to be active too. So it would be helpful for you to meet those folks. Well, I'm just worried because of the uh, December 1st, if they're driving from there over the past, it might be snowing. It might be, and it, it does this in March too. It doesn't matter. So, um, <laughs> Uh, I, and I do this at least once a month, so uh, yeah, it's, it is a concern, and some of them may need to, will want to fly. Are we going to have a legislature? <coughs> yes, Andy Milling will uh, be be there. Uh, I heard that confirmation, and uh, I don't know the other speakers yet. They're still working on it, but our lobby team chair, uh, Maddie Von Hoff, will be here, along with a couple of lobby team people. And we'll be talking a lot about the democracy issues um, and that being a priority moving forward on all of the, the voting things. So, so thank you. Thank you, Anne. And uh, we will all be focused on the action workshop coming up because those things are very worthwhile. Um, our next speaker is Brian Holacek. He is a parent and the chair of the levy campaign for the East Valley School District 361. He's going to come up and tell us a little bit about that. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Brian Holacek, and as Susan introduced, I'm a parent in the East Valley School District, and I'm chairing the um, our upcoming levy campaign that we have. And our levy campaign is all centered around safety and security with a little bit of infrastructure. So uh, we're a district that has three elementary schools, a middle school, and a high school, and we have a, a, a full tech type um, school at the main district office. All of our schools are extremely uh, challenged in the security area. Um, and I want to point out a couple quick examples. Uh, every classroom that's almost without uh, uh, any reasonable doubt, every classroom in our district does not have a way to lock the doors from the inside of the classroom. So, and that's a big concern today. So every teacher in our district has a key that they have to physically put in the door on the hallway side of the door to, to lock. So you can imagine if there was an intruder that got in, um, that'd be very difficult to, to keep your students safe. Um, as Dr. Anderson pointed out, they're having zero entries, or they're creating single point entries to all of their schools. None of the East Valley schools right now have um, uh, single point entries. We are, um, we are, or excuse me, we have single point entries. Most of the entries we're creating now today has a double vestibule type of situation where you can buzz in and see the person who's walking in. So what we're really trying to do is we're running a two year levy at a zero tax <coughs> increase. In fact, our taxes, just like Dr. Anderson said, are, are down slightly. Um, and it's a $13 million tax is what it is. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna do the, the point of entry, since the, the double vestibules, we're upgrading our locks. Um, another one, and I, I don't mean to paint a bad picture, I'm actually excited about being a part of this campaign. Um, we don't have any good way to communicate from a classroom to the, to the principal's office and vice versa. So if somebody came in in the main office to a, a single entry, then there's no mechanism, because all of our stuff is outdated, to 
be able to shout out to all the classrooms. So um, we're in kind of a bad situation. Um, and I think we have a, we stand to have a, uh, make some significant improvements. And I'll hand out just to some more track. I've got things like Captain 194. Uh, there's four for each row, I'm sorry. I had chair and uh, we've got some new stuff. Uh, we've got a website that we're just setting up, um, uh, starting a social media side a little bit different. We, we really have operated on an extremely small budget. A lot of our surrounding districts have uh, had quite a few improvements. Uh, Spokane schools doing wonderful things in their schools. Central Valley schools doing wonderful things in the community. And it, I'll share something. This, this levy for us is just a small step because really our, our district has some some serious building um, type issues that we need to get. We, we haven't had a significant remodel since the 90s. So all of our schools, like I said, we don't have a lot of them, smaller district in the area, but we, we, the, the next step um, is to run a, a larger campaign. It will be a bond, and it'll be uh, much more significant. Will this be on the ballot for Spokane? Yeah, yeah, uh, well, for just um, East Valley residents. East Valley residents. So, so if you have friends or neighbors or grandkids or you see somebody, oh, okay. I, I know this, okay. this group so. might be influential to, to you know, pass on the message to somebody else. Um, let's see, in addition, does anybody have, has anybody been out by the East Valley High School? Do you know where that's going to If you drive yeah. Sullivan and you go north, if you're in the valley and you're a north side and you want to go from Coeur d'Alene to the north side, you probably get off on Sullivan and yeah. go up Sullivan and go past the high school, then the middle school of Port Porter. Okay. Yeah, so now what's going what's going on there is, in our district there's two schools, the middle school and the high school, and what they're doing now is they're gonna continue Sullivan, it goes right through our schools, oh. meanders up the hill, and it will connect with Porter. So that's been also, that's so part of this levy will pay for the difference between what Spokane County and our superintendent is negotiating with the, the county, and then what the additional need is that, that we need. We've got some softball and baseball fields that are in there. The plan right now um, is that uh, at one time we, there was talk about putting an overpass, and I know the superintendent, Kelly Shea, uh, certainly does not want students over the top of four lanes of, of cars. That's just a bad situation. <laughs> so, so what we're doing is we're putting in an underpass, oh, and it will extend the, it's a five lane road basically and it's wide enough to get all the district's service vehicles, trucks, or large lawnmowers um, through that passageway. So again, the county is, is, is going to pay for a portion of this, but what they don't pay, part of this levy will fund that. Um, let's see, so I, I, I'm always, I, I like to be a cup, a cup half full guy, so a couple things I've challenged our group with is really to um, increase the number of voters that we get out in our district. We have about 17,000 residents, and if we're lucky, we're getting five to 7,000 people voting. And so what we're really trying to do is push the number of folks that are voting, because it's, uh, it's important to get out and vote. Uh, and we're also trying to educate people as to why, um, why you would vote, and then we want to demonstrate that we're good stewards of everyone's tax money, especially in schools. Um, Another, uh, so this, uh, so what we're also trying to do is we're also trying to raise the, our percentage. So I like to dream a little bit big. I said 70%, I want 70% yes votes. I've had some challengers to say, you'll be lucky to get 60, but I'm going for 70. And if we land somewhere there, that's great. What we're trying to do is build momentum for our next campaign. So, um, are there any questions? I kind of ran through that pretty quickly. Again, big picture for our levy is we're, we're, we're changing our culture, we're making our buildings more secure. It's important to keep to take care of our, our teachers. It's important to take care of our students and our community. And so um, this is really going to bridge. It's a small gap. 
some folks have asked, you're gonna go spend 13 million on our schools and then you wanna go do a bond, run a bond in two years. Well again, we're taking that all into consideration and we're gonna make sure that if we make an upgrade to a, a door like this, that we could either use this hardware, this two year old hardware that we put in on a future door and we're just gonna retrofit these. And our new vestibules that we'll build will be the same way. Let's use the materials we just put in and we can transfer that to the new schools as we build them. Yes, ma'am. So when the, when the construction, is it gonna go to the, repeat, to the west of the middle school? Or is that how it's gonna? No, so, um, so us, if you did <coughs> Sullivan yeah, and you missed the four-way stop and you just kept going directly straight, there will be a road that will be north. Up, up the hill, <laughs> thank you, yes. Over the forest. You've been there. <laughs> <laughs> been there. Oh, yeah. uh, Pardon me? Be over the school? No, no, it'll be behind the school, so behind you continue school. north <laughs> through their grassy fields. Kind of between, yeah, it'll kind of make a little, like a little S, that S shape. It'll meander through there a little bit, yeah. There's a church that sits on the corner, and it basically ties in. Sorry about that. Yes. Eligible to vote? Uh, not, I'd say about 13% registered to vote who would be 18 by the next election. So it could be any time between now and the end of the school year. Yeah, okay. That's funny. That's so real to me because I have a 19 year old. And when he just oh, turned 18 last summer, yeah. the first election, I think it was an August election that was coming up, and we almost didn't get him registered to vote. It just, like, yeah, you almost forget as a new graduate and an 18 year old, that's important to make sure you're registered. You can even say, give him a, a clue if he votes because you really appreciate it. Yes. You know. Yes. No, he just says, Dad, what did you vote for? <laughs> well, we we talked in, in government classes. We spoke oh, in yeah. government classes because it's better to speak yeah. with a small group, the teacher, than in a much larger group. Yeah. <laughs> that makes good sense. How much yeah. is the money? A 13 million. 13 million. Yeah, just over, just barely over 13 million. And again, we're not going to be able to get to everything, but we're going to sure make things a lot better than they are right now. You know, that's one of our causes is to try to get the, the younger people involved in voting. For sure. And we have a civics program that okay. we're trying to promote. Okay. Uh, it's called the State Land. Okay. And actually, we're very involved with District 81. Okay. And that's one of the things that if we got more members out in the valley, they can help with that. Or even some of the parents that just want to yeah. do that. Yeah. So you might take that message back. <coughs> I'll have to, I'll have yeah. to get that. Yeah. yeah. Great. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll uh, be getting in contact with Beth because okay. she is doing a really great job on, on reaching out to all the schools in the area to okay. uh, get young people on the ground yeah. where they yes. may have the chance to get to For sure. Isaiah well, does. It is important. We all think it's important. That's why we are people. Yep. Voters, as you know. Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you so much thank for you. joining us. Thank you. Thank you. But they, they contain all the main stuff. And they're all for each of the four uh, initiatives. And I want to urge you all to pick up one. Are you going to just pass them around? Or, yeah, yeah, why don't we just why do that? Not? We'll talk about these as she's doing that. Uh, the first one, I've been talking about them in numerical order, is number 960, which is 940. Really? Yeah, it was wrong in your voter. Oh, that's my fault. I'm sorry. Well, <laughs> no, I didn't do that. Anyway, I do it's, I got very close. It's 940, and I believe Anne. 
I believe he handed the paper she just handed out. Yeah. This one um, covers um, additional law enforcement training requirements and spells out the good faith standard for officer criminal liability in those exceptional circumstances where deadly force is used. Um, the bill would require officers to undergo violence de-escalation and mental health training, and that's outlined in detail in sections three and four of the bill. The object of this training is to give police officers greater skills in resolving conflicts without- Susan, can I stop you for just yes, a minute? Certainly. Can you please share? I had no idea that I just had these, so there are about 25 of each one of them. Just make sure you're looking at the 940. Yes, one. Right, well, 940. Yes, that's number Sorry, one. Sorry, Susan. That's fine. Thank you. Um, so we're talking about uh, they're going to be uh, required to take violence, de escalation, and mental health training and first aid training. And then the bill contains. Uh, in addition to the use of deadly force statute language, adopting specific good faith standard for the use of deadly force by law enforcement officers. Uh, and uh, there is an objective good faith test and a subjective good faith test, and the good faith standard has to uh, meet both of those tests. Uh, objective is reasonable officer in light of all the facts and circumstances would do the same thing and the subjective good faith is yeah he really thought that uh, he was in danger of additional do you happen to know since I was a teacher and I'm sure all teachers can relate to this every year we have to go training online you know anti-bullying anti-harassment yeah. sexual harassment do the police have to do this also every year uh, I read you their training uh, I don't know is that what but that would be good. And I'm not sure if in, in the, uh, uh, Pam, your voter, uh, had all of the initiatives. This is just a summary of them. And so if you really want to get into that nitty gritty, you can find that in yeah, the there. They yeah. were attached to the voter. They were so attached to the voter. They're also available online. Oh, yeah. on the city's website. These are available online as well if you go to the lwdwa.org site. Okay. This thing was upstairs in the library here. I took it when I came across it from the stores. Oh, the voters' pamphlets are out. Okay. Yeah. This one you'll remember we supported way back in the signature gathering stage. Um, and this is the one where the legislature tried to get creative at the end of the session last year and passed their own bill. And then the, uh, the courts ultimately decided 940 would be the only one on the ballot. So they can make some changes to them with two thirds uh, after, but it has to get passed first. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we have the league has supported this bill. Yeah, uh, believe that increased training and accountability will increase safety of all communities, especially minority communities and persons with mental health problems. Uh, oh, even medical problems. Opponents um, include the Washington State FOP and Association of Sheriffs and Police Chiefs and Council of Metropolitan Police and Sheriffs and Seattle Police Officers. They believe the initiative's main goal is to lower the bar for the prosecution of officers who use deadly force and point out that it comes with no funding to address the main drivers of deadly confrontations, namely mental illness, drug abuse, and hopeless homelessness. So uh, this 940 summary, and uh, I'll give mine up when I'm done with it too, uh, has uh, a good detailed uh, pro and con on this particular issue. Uh, the next- I think the main reason they're doing it is to prevent that death to the population. That's, that's what the, the violence has resulted in a death to those mm -hmm. individuals instead of just arresting them. Well, and also, yes, also, that's interesting. Uh, it says when, and this bill also has a provision that says when deadly force results in death, substantial bodily harm or great bodily harm, 
an independent investigation must be completed to inform the determination of whether the use of deadly force, deadly force met the proper standard. So, uh, that's that. Uh, the next one is... Number 1631 concerning an act of a pollution fee on large emitters. And uh, that, this is uh, what they're trying to do since the one last year didn't, didn't go, the carbon tax one didn't go down. Um, certain large emit emitters would have to pay. Uh, a pollution fee of $15 per metric ton of carbon on, uh, based on the carbon content of fossil fuels sold to use within the state and electricity generated within or imported for consumption in the state. And this fee would be increased by $2 annually until the state's greenhouse gas reduction goals are met. Uh, the revenues from this fee would be deposited in a cleanup pollution fund to be used to fund various programs and projects related to the environment. The largest beneficiary of the fund would be uh, clean air and clean energy projects um, that yield or facilitate verifiable reduction in pollution or assist affected workers or people of lower incomes during transition to a clean energy economy. And these are such things as solar or wind power, increasing energy efficiency in new and existing buildings, reducing transportation-related carbon emissions, replacing the use of natural gas with gas not derived from fossil fuels. And uh, the section of this bill pertaining to this contains seven pages of examples of different kinds of projects that they could do with this stuff. And 70, about 70% 70 of the fees that they collect would go to these projects. Uh, second greatest beneficiary would be the Clean Water and Healthy Forest projects uh, to increase the resiliency of the state water and forest to, to uh, the impact of climate change. And then the third tranche would be the Healthy Communities Investment pro Programs which would prepare communities for challenges caused by climate change and to ensure that the impact of climate change are not disproportionately borne by certain populations. Uh, the uh, Section 8 spells out in detail how the, the, the fee actually works. Uh, the fee would be assessed against large emitters, and large emitters are defined as uh, the people you would expect, an importer, for example, an importer of electricity that was generated using fossil fuels, a power plant located in the state of Washington that generates electricity using fossil fuels, a seller of fossil fuels to end users or consumers, or from combined heat and power, a refinery facility for crude oil, crude oil derivatives, and other fossil fuels consumed by or in a refinery facility. So that, that's the group that would get this tax, or excuse me, fee. Um, and there are uh, certain fossil fuels that would be exempt from the pollution fee. And these would be fossil fuels brought into the state in fuel supply tanks of a motor vehicle, vessel locomotive, or aircraft. Fossil fuels that are exported or sold for export outside of Washington. Fossil fuels directly or eventually supplied to a light and power business for purposes of generating electricity, aircraft fuels and maritime fuels, diesel fuels, biodiesel or aircraft fuels when these fuels are used solely for agricultural purposes by a farm fuel user, and pollution emissions from a coal closure facility. Uh, and there are some many arguments pro and con. We've seen these on the uh, TV and summary is um, the supporters believe that the initial tip will create thousands of jobs, minimize pollution, 
resulting in cleaner air, water, and natural resources. And those who are opposed say that the fee could result in Washingtonians paying more per gallon of gas if oil refineries choose to pass the cost of the fee on to consumers rather than limiting their pollution. And that the measure would not reduce global carbon emissions. And there's much more detail on the pros and the cons on this in this thing. Yes, ma'am. I've been out canvassing for this about three times. So I've met tons of people that don't like it, and they don't they don't believe in the science. But it's interesting because one woman has a child that's choosing medicines that's based on the science. Um, so as a physician, I will tell you that the mortality rate for asthma has gone up 40 percent since 1980. In children under 18, it's gone up 90 percent. I have one of those children that I've got with somebody swimming associated asthma. I also will point out that this, this study just came out from climate scientists. We saw it in the paper today. So we have to take an initial step, is what I talked to folks, and I think I've met three that were radically opposed. Oh, I'm gonna pay more money. I will tell you that you are already paying more money. Yeah. If people with lung disease and heart disease end up in the ER, we're all paying for it. If you don't understand how healthcare is paid for, that's why your cotton ball is $18 in the hospital, and your aspirin is $32. So we all pay for it. But what is it like? <coughs> So if we don't take an initiative here, because we cannot count on uh, our EPA or our national government right now, uh, then people are all upset. But one way or the other, we are all paying for the effects of climate changes, what I'd like to point out. The other thing anymore. that's come out, too, is that, um, oh, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> that, um, no, it has to do with, oh, it'll come to me, but I think the most, one of the most important things is that there are, it says there are up to 250 groups in the state of Washington that are behind this. And all of the um, opposition is coming from big oil. Yeah. And uh, the, the other part is that really the rest of the country is looking to see how this goes in Washington, that this, is, this could possibly take effect through uh, citizen initiative. And then one coal plant's going offline, by the way. That's why it's down. Yeah, so it's going online. I, just a question, does the league have a position on any of these initiatives? Yeah, and I, I mean, I can tell them to you all, I, and since this is a league meeting and not really a voter service forum, we can do that. So, uh, yes, the league took a position on this um, last time or something. Can you say 1094 is what's on the Oh, I, in favor. <laughs> <laughs> what about 940? Yeah, she said no. I said that. Yeah. Oh, I'll I'm do sorry. those as we go. Yeah. Okay. 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 How about that? Um, so, yeah, we do have some very active climate change and energy people that have been involved in this um, um, for the last several years. The more we ignore this, the more we're going to see more and more fires, mm -hmm. more and more yeah. environmental issues in our state. This. We cannot change. So we, this really needs to be impacted by us. And we will need to be paying much more. We're going to pay much more. Our children will yeah. be able to live on the earth, our grandchildren especially. Well, that's just Labor Day will be our holiday. So yeah. uh, will it impact like the coal trains that come in? No. Okay. And will no, yeah, not now, this, is, uh, this particular piece of legislation addresses it addresses the, uh, the production of the uh, public health and safety. Okay, so the, if we if Avista is sold to that Canadian company, then Avista will won't it won't impact Avista, right? You know, I can't add to that. I mean, I'm not saying I'm for or against it. I'm just trying to gather information. Yeah. Right. I, I know some people who say that it won't impact big sources of fossil fuels and it will only impact small businesses. Well, there were, that's, that's not, not uh, I mean, that's why. No. Yeah. Those are not, those are not, the, uh, it's not only certainly small uh, businesses do not fall under the definition of large emitters. Okay. Right. Large emitters is talking about. Uh, that's coming out of uh, yeah. oil stacks. And that kind of yeah. Thing. Okay. All right. So that would be, you know, refineries and, and big. Boeing, do they have um, Oh, sure they do. Well, and that is one of the power plants. Uh, talks on there. I, I'm sorry, I don't have a list of 
the uh, emitters that are not going to be affected. Lisa, have you uh, seen that? Well, there's that coal plant that's going offline that's in West Central, it's somewhere in the middle state. I don't remember the other one, you know, Yeah, but uh, I mean, I, it's been perfect, but it's a start. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 so we got to get our foot in the door, yeah. and if we get yes. this, then we, yeah, we can, we can be more better with it. Okay, well, let's just quickly go on. The uh, next measure we're talking about is 1634, and this one is about, it concerns taxation on groceries. And no, 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 no. taxation. <laughs> well, it says, it says, yeah, well, yeah, it says no existing tax fee or other assessment on groceries may be increased in rate, scope, base or otherwise after January 15, 2018, unless it applies to a broad range of businesses and business activity, and, get ready for this ladies, does not establish or rely on a classification related to or involving groceries or a subset of groceries for purposes of establishing or otherwise resulting in a higher tax rate due to such classification. And um, interestingly enough, the uh, proponents of this are, um, let's see, oh, American Beverage Association, supported by the Washington Farm Bureau, the Washington Food and Beverage Association, the Korean American Grocers Association of Washington, and the Joint Council of Teamsters 28, and their argument that uh, food is a basic need, we shouldn't tax, uh, a tax on food is gonna be, have extremely disproportionate burdens on the poor, and low-income families who spend a large portion of their money uh, on food than other people and uh, hurts small business owners and so on and so forth. Uh, the arguments against the measure, American Heart Association, Childhood Obesity Prevention Coalition, and the Anti-Hunger and Nutrition Coalition oppose this initiative because uh, the Childhood Obesity Prevention Coalition believes that municipalities should maintain their legal authority to impose taxes on sugary drinks to improve public health. And, uh, the, some argue that the measure is misleading because it would not actually address the affordability of food and would stop local governments from being able to implement innovative strategies to raise significant funds to address access to healthy food. So that takes care of that. No. <laughs> yes. I just, just going to say, in some states, they have taxes on the farms, so far. Uh, yeah. Manhattan tried to do that, and they think it eventually yeah. got got overturned yeah. by. City of Seattle did, yeah. it, and that's why this came yeah. up. Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. so it's about it's not about basic food. It's, about it's not right. about poor people not being able to eat. Yeah, yeah it's about food, food, food stamps <laughs> for Coca Cola and no, potato right. chips. Yes. Yeah. What this does is it takes away any uh, possibility for a local jurisdiction. To, to apply this tax. Yes. It's not going to affect the tax right now. Yeah. And it's pretty much been driven by the beverage industry. Yeah. Yeah. So the league is for the instance. league has taken no position on it. They're also hiring if I had a young man come to my house about this who was in favor of it. Who was from Texas. Oh yeah. Uh, they're hiring people from uh, out of state to come in and Doorbell. Did you hear that? No. She had someone come to her door canvassing for it who was hired and was here for the Oh, yeah. I had, uh, I had someone come to my door and we had a long conversation and she admitted I'm being paid to do this. Yeah. Um, and by the way, I agree with me and she said, I said, well, frankly, I'm a physician. I went to some diabetes, do we need to see? Yeah. The fellow that came to my door was from Texas. Yeah. But they're, they're paid. Yeah. yeah. I meant she was paid to do it. Yeah. I'm not paid by the <laughs> no, they are there. They wanted to preclude jurisdictions from being able to assess a tax on certain things. They want to preclude. Yeah, they say you can't raise taxes on food if it only applies to certain categories of food. And it just it, it harms those kinds of things. Um, Thank you.
Okay. <laughs> and then last but not least is 1639, if that's the right number. Yes. Yes. Okay. And that one is um, the Firearms and Dangerous Weapons Amendments to that legislation. Um, uh, it changes the requirement for enhanced background checks to add, among other things, proof that the purchaser has completed a firearms safety training program. It adds a couple of new additions pertaining to secure storage of firearms and then uh, limits the purchase or sale of pistols or semi-automatic weapons to uh, 21 years is the age limit. Uh, and then they are want to come up with a new addition to this uh, law, developing a process to verify at least annually that all licensed owners of firearms remain eligible to possess a firearm under state and federal law. So every, uh, if they have work it, work out how to do it, check every year that everybody who <coughs> has a permit is still legally eligible to own a firearm. Uh, the rest of the sections uh, look to me like they were amended more or less just to add uh, semi-automatic weapons to, to the, the wording of the laws so that uh, they're not big changes, but they, they say these things also apply to semi-automatic weapons. And that was uh, rules governing the waiting period for purchasing a firearm, uh, rules governing the waiver of confidentiality so that when you get a gun license, you're um, authorizing uh, uh, health records uh, relevant to your eligibility to own a firearm, purchase a firearm, uh, and rules governing the license of firearm dealers, uh, background checks, for sale of firearms, and uh, also they want to ex exclude the sale of semi-automatic weapons from the weapons that may be sold to residents of a state other than Washington. So that's... Uh, it also criminal criminalizes non-compliant firearm storage. Ah. So Ooh. that if, you're, if guns are not properly stored and locked up, yeah. then and if they then result in a crime being committed, then the owner of the firearm is liable. Is the league voting? Yes, the league favors this. Okay. There was similar legislation in the legislature, um, in our state legislature last year that didn't pass, and so then this initiative came out, survived several court challenges, if you were following that over the summer, <laughs> in terms of uh, uh, Format, you know, a funky yeah. little things. So yeah. Thank you. And well, then. No, there's one more. Oh, the advisory. Oh, no, there's an advisory vote. Oh, the advisory vote about all these voters is something else. Huh? This is a, no, this is a state oh, advisory gosh, vote. I missed that. Oh, and <laughs> here I'll just let you guys see. Number nineteen. The legislator. Well, don't even spend time. Right? I mean, these advisory votes are in this part of this information sheet that will come back to you. Just basically, it's, it's non-binding. Oh. It's advisory. You get to see it, and it's all because of our favorite initiative guy. Oh, uh, well, that's uh, <laughs> is, is it his? It's no. It, no it's he again. got this into, and I can't even Judy. remember what bill. I don't says on there, but that when the legislature authorizes money for something like this, that it has to go to a vote of the people, but it's not binding. So um, anyway, we just put out this basic information sheet so that um, you can just see that. Some people choose to just not vote on them. Um, it's totally up to you what you want to do. <laughs> so. Okay, well, I guess that's... And we have no position. We don't have a position on this. Done by me. Okay, well, I guess that 
but that takes care of us. Um, this was a great crowd. Thank you all for coming. One man of arm. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. And we do have our next uh, meeting is going to be here on the second Tuesday, and it's going to be on the census. Ooh, I mean, okay. Yes. Yeah. And we're going to have two coffees for the month of October, and they'll be on the north side. One will be 9.30 in the morning. they will be for scones, coffee, and tea to come and learn about the lead. And even if you've been in for a while to come and and just get kind of renewed on what it's about. And then there'll be an easy one at 6.30 with light appetizers. So thank you to all of you that are uh, I have one final thing, uh, quickly. Uh, Sally, our treasurer, was unable to make it here tonight, so if anybody has to check for her, then you turn it over to me and you can see what she gets. And for the census, Allison McCaffrey. McCaffrey will be here to speak on it. She was here last year. She really knows a lot about it. And there's a, you know, there's a lot of turmoil. Thank you for moderating. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Susan. Thank you to our